In August of 2013, the Ural Archaeological Expedition of the Institute of Archaeology of the Russian Academy of Sciences, led by Dr. Leonid Yablonsky, resumed excavations of the Filipovka 1 necropolis, a world-famous archaeological site. The decision to conduct additional excavations was made with the support of the Ministry of Culture and External Relations of the Orenburg region and the Bashkir State Pedagogical University. Initially, the expedition's only plan was to investigate the remainder of the mound and bring the study to a logical conclusion. Nothing there promised a sensational discovery. During the excavation of the Royal Mound 1, archaeologists discovered a woman's grave dating back to the 4th century BC. Anthropological examination showed that the remains found in the grave belonged to a woman who died at the age of about 35. She was lying on her back, stretched out with her head facing south. The features of the ornate costume of the buried woman indicate that the grave was the grave of a woman of high social status. Two clusters of colorful beads and small gold, coral and stone beads were found under the arms of the buried woman, from the middle of the shoulder to the middle of the forearm. These may have been decorative ornaments on an item of clothing. Images of several exotic animals, probably deer, with fantastical antlers following one another, were barely visible on the pressed sand. Thanks to the conservator Olga Anikeva, who was part of the archaeological expedition, the surviving fragments of the embroidery were documented and removed from the remains, along with fragments of soil. As it turned out later, it was this method of removal that allowed the fragments of the embroidery to be preserved. One fragment was taken by the archaeologists just like this, and it was very badly preserved. This was one. This one. The archaeologists thought it was PVA. PVA. Olga Anikeva put PVA on it, and this way she managed to preserve almost the entire fragment целиком почти весь рисунок, как потом оказалось. At the first stage of the work, a comprehensive study of the materials from which the rosettes and beads from the Filipovko site were made was carried out. Using the methods of micro X-ray fluorescence analysis and optical and electron microscopy, we were able to determine the nature of the origin and elemental composition of the alloys of the objects. The analysis of the gold beads by scanning electron microscopy made it possible to establish that sheet gold with a precious metal content of 84 to 85 percent was used to make them. The triple alloy, gold, silver and copper, from which the beads were made, is a type of gold alloy typical of Greek jewellery tradition. The gold beads vary in shape from almost round to biconical, and part almost cylindrical, with a pronounced bend in the middle, measuring approximately 3 mm. The colourless glass beads show traces of iridization and corrosion of the surface layer due to the natural degradation of the glass. The place where the beads might have been made could have been in the Middle East, one of the strongest glass-making centers of that period. The examination of red glass beads showed that a valuable type of coral, presumably Mediterranean, was used to embroider the clothes from the Filipovka site. The design was probably first applied to the cloth backing with some kind of dye, and then the beads were stitched on top of this stencil which is evidenced by the meticulous precision of the work and the detailed way in which the images were depicted. When the restoration of the embroidery fragments began, it was necessary to work out a technique for the initial cleaning of the beads and the gold rosettes. Using wooden sticks, rosettes were cleaned of soil deposits and traces of glue. They were then thoroughly washed in a solution of water and alcohol. Using a bristle brush, the surface of the metal was cleaned of glue and residual soil deposits. As the layers were dismantled, the individual sections of the embroidery were carefully photographed and maps were made of the locations of the preserved beads. Each bead was marked on the map chart and transferred to a specially prepared work surface covered with plasticine, 
following the preserved embroidery pattern. The mechanical cleaning of the beads from traces of glue, dirt and sand was done using brushes of different hardness and thin needles. Sandstone beads were additionally reinforced with a special compound. The next stage of the work involved the preparation of the backing material, a silk gauze tinted light brown. After the cleaning and conservation, the embroidery elements were transferred from the marble to the silk gauze in a small hoop and attached to it. At the final stage of the work, the scattered fragments were assembled and stitched together on specially prepared cotton fabric, following the original embroidery tracing. Because the through holes of some of the beads are extremely thin, we had to use a waxed thread or monofilament to reinforce them. Behind are a year and a half of meticulous work. Natalia Sinitsana managed to preserve and restore the fragments of the beaded embroidery which adorned the dress of the Sarmatian priestess. The restored fragments of the beaded embroidery took their rightful place at their exhibition Gold of the Sarmatian Chieftains, which opened in the Pushkin State Museum. And now, in 2023, this object, in my opinion, is one of the iconic pieces in the exhibition Gold of Sarmatian Chieftains, which is currently open at the Pushkin Museum. At the moment, this collection connects a large number of researchers, scientists and archaeologists, as well as museum staff and art historians. For us, this piece is very significant. Significant in the sense that after exhibiting it at the Pushkin State, it will come back to Orenburg and will be included in the main display in our museum and will be exhibited in the Golden Treasury, where we will tell our visitors and guests of the city about the status of this item. I very much hope that the history of this object will encourage further research into this site and the presentation of this collection not only in Russia, but hopefully also abroad. Because of the work that was done on this subject alone, it astonishes with its abundance of enthusiastic people, the labor that went into it and the research itself. In my opinion, it will be a worthy example which will encourage scholars to pay attention to the collection of gold on display. And the most wonderful thing is that through museum methods, we tell about this object in terms of its entering into a scholarly discourse, in terms of its popularization, and also we tell people about one of the important symbols, brands not only of the Orenburg region but also of Russia in general, this collection of Sarmatian gold.